Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, everybody, for for joining us. It's a it's a big privilege for me um, to uh, be part of your program and to meet you on this uh, happy Hanukkah uh, and uh, to speak about uh, this topic. Uh, this is a uh, we're going to be discussing a a short Talmudic story that, uh, in first glance doesn't have to do with Hanukkah, but we'll see, we may see the connection later. Um, this uh, story appears in Masechet Avodah Zarah in the Bavli. I'll share it on the screen. Uh, and now you can see in the chat as well, you have a link uh, to download the uh, source sheet. And um, I'll just, okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, the sources here are brought in the uh, uh, original Hebrew and Aramaic uh, from the sources in the Talmud, but I also brought the English translation for every source, and we'll be reading it directly from the English translation, okay, in order to make things shorter and easier. So uh, our story begins uh, in Masechet Avodah Zarah, in the Bavli, in source number one here on the on the source sheet, and um, it begins in in on line two, line one, which precedes the story, tells us about the this is the context that the story appears in. It's a saying by Rav Hanan Bar Rava, uh, who says Kalenda is kept on the eight days following the winter solstice, and Saturnalia on the eight days preceding. The solstice. Okay, this is the what leads the Gemara to the into the story. Um, this is uh, actually addressing a line in the Mishnah. The Mishnah in Masechet Avodah Zarah relates to uh, different pagan holidays, especially those in the Roman culture, which was the uh, cultural con cultural context here in Eretz Israel. Uh, where the rabbis of the Mishnah the Tanaim and the Amoraim in Eretz Israel, this was uh, basically what they uh, what what they encountered in uh, the the uh, Gentile society around them, surrounding them, and and uh, um, the Mish the Mishnah of Avodah Zarah uh, uh, tells us all kinds of halachot dealing with these pagan holidays and how we as Jews are to relate to them. And then the Mishnah lists a few of those pagan holidays, and two of them are mentioned here. Two of them are called in the Mishnah Kalenda and uh, Saturnura, okay, which I translated already here as Saturnalia. These are two holidays, two Roman pagan holidays, which were kept uh, by the Romans in celebrated by the Romans in the winter um, on both sides of the winter solstice. The winter solstice, the day that w in which the days uh, uh, stop becoming shorter and start getting longer, and the nights uh, stop becoming longer and be begin getting shorter again, okay, that day, uh, today, the calendar that we use, it's uh, usually around December 21st, but uh, we use the Gregorian calendar, at those times, it was the Julian calendar, originally instated by Julius Caesar. And on that calendar, the winter solstice was on December 25th, except, uh, of course, this is a, a, um, a familiar date, but December 25th at that time, that, that was before Christianity actually celebrated Christmas on that, on, on that date. And when Julius Caesar uh, uh, created that Julian calendar, of course, Christianity did, had, had, did not exist yet, okay? But even later on, uh, after Christianity started, the first, second century, um, they did not celebrate Christmas yet, uh, on, on, or, or certainly not on December 25th, okay? This uh, all started later. So December 25th at that time was just the winter solstice, and the Romans celebrated that date, the winter solstice, as a, a pagan holiday that was uh, uh, celebrating something that had to do with the sun, right? Because the sun uh, sort of uh, the, uh, 
uh, uh, has a kind of a victory on that on that date because up to that date the days are becoming shorter and again in in pagan terms the 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 sun is of course a god and that god is being uh, uh, um, defeated until that time but then it turns around right and then and then the sun starts uh, raining so to speak for more hours of the day and then that's why that's why they celebrated that day as the day that the, that the sun uh, was victorious. Can okay. I say, can I suggest something from what you sure. just said? Sure. You said Saturnuria, which you collect, which you corrected to Saturn from Saturnalia, and your correction I accept, and that's good. But it's interesting, Saturn Nair. It's against the the Nair. Absolutely, absolutely, you are correct. The Latin name of that holiday, Saturnalia. That's why I I translated it as Saturnalia. The Latin day, the Latin name for for Calenda, by the way, was uh, Calendus. And uh, um, but when uh, the Mishnah calls Saturnalia Saturnura, it is not. It's not a. It's not a mistake. It is a wordplay on the name Saturnalia. It's calling it Saturnura. Because uh, the, in Aramaic, okay, the, the, these are two words, satanura, exactly like you're saying. It's it's to do, do, do the commentators say that what you're just saying? Yes, yes, they do. Yeah. Okay, so so they they uh, uh, actually uh, uh, so satanura is is to is 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 sort of to to uh, cover the light or to 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 uh, uh, reduce the light. Okay, like satar with a tough. Is to okay. So that, thank you for that. That, 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 that might have been the Satan that attacked Bill Am. No, it's not Satan. It's Satar with a resh. It means it means it, it means to contradict something. It's like a stira. Okay, it's not it's not uh, uh, Satan with a nun. Okay, Satar Nura. Satar Nura. If you're changing, but if you're changing letter, letters, you can also change the letter. Letter of Satar to Satan. That 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 would be your own uh, personal midrash, and that's beautiful. But the the Gemara did something uh, different. Okay, it it, it or the Mishnah already. Okay, it it uh, uh, transcripted it as Satar Nura. Thank anyway, you very much indeed. That was fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so th this is like the background, and uh, now the the uh, uh, Gemara tells us a story. Okay, the story starts on line two. Our rabbis taught when Adam, Adam Arishon, saw the day getting gradually shorter, and uh, don't forget that he was the only, he and Chava were the only human beings which were actually born as adults, right? Okay, so they're both, this is their first year in their life, but they're actually aware and understanding things that are happening. And he sees that the days are getting shorter. This is his first winter. Okay, according to the tradition, of course, in which he, he was uh, created on Rosh Hashanah, okay, in the beginning of Tishrei. Anyway, so when he sees this, so he, he uh, panics. He said, woe is me, perhaps because I have sinned, the world around me is being darkened and returning to its state of chaos and confusion. This then is the kind of death to which I have been sentenced from heaven. Okay, he interprets what is happening in, in nature as relating to his own sin, of course, it's the sin in Gan Eden, uh, eating from Etzadat, and and if you you recall that 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 sin uh, um, originally, at least their thought about it was that once they eat from the tree, they will die, but um, that didn't happen right away. But Adam is afraid that that this is actually what's happening now. Don't forget that the world was created out of darkness, right? It was at home. And the first thing created was light, Yehi Or. So um, what Adam is seeing, what he's experiencing is that the light is getting, uh, uh, is the days are getting darker, okay? And the light is being reduced every day. And so that's what he thinks is happening. So he thinks this is a process which is actually leading to the end of the world and to his own death, of course. So he is very anxious about this. And I'm continuing here on line four. So he began 
keeping an eight day fast. Okay, he fasted for eight days, and of course, of course, he prayed according to some of the the uh, um, versions. The word he he prayed was also is also added here, and. Um, then, but as he observed the winter solstice, okay, so he saw that it was actually reversed and, and the days began, began coming longer and noted the day getting increasingly longer, he said, this is the world's course, okay? This is just a natural cycle of the world. And he set forth to keep an eight days festivity, okay? He, he had a celebrated a festival of eight days. In the following year, he appointed, he appointed both his festivals, okay? Both uh, uh, the eight days on which he fasted before the solstice and the eight days on which he celebrated after the solstice, the next year and the next years uh, after that, he, he celebrated both periods of eight, eight days. Now he fixed them for the sake of heaven, but the idol worshipers, okay? mentioned in the Mishnah, appointed them for the sake of idolatry. So this story is sort of trying to explain that uh, these pagan holidays have an origin uh, originating by, uh, and actually being created originally by Adam Arishon, who creates them uh, L'Shem Shamaim, as it says in the Hebrew. He creates them as part of his uh, worship of God. But uh, uh, eventually, Later on, the uh, idol worshippers turned them into uh, pagan holidays for their idols. Okay, that, that's, so that's, that's the story. Now, um, as we read the story, okay, we, I, I think the beginning is, is, is pretty clear. It's pretty, it's, it, it's, it's pretty uh, understandable, okay, why he becomes filled with anxiety when he sees the world becoming darker and darker and colder, okay, that's enough. Even even today, even though we know everything that we know about science and 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 about nature, okay, when the winter uh, uh, gradually descends on us, right? Uh, so we see that that that, that people are uh, uh, a little bit uh, depressed and. Uh, but think think of Adam not even knowing what's going on, and in the ancient world. Of course, people took this as as a, as a, a, a okay. They didn't know they didn't know everything that we know about science. Okay, so they they, they treated this as, as as something that was happening that had to do with the gods. Okay, so 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 Adam is panicking here, and that's that's very clear. And when he sees that everything is going to be okay because the days become uh, uh, longer again, we can understand why he celebrates. Um, question is, I, I actually, when I read this, I have, I, I do have two questions about it. Uh, one question is why, uh, um, why he's, why he's celebrating, okay, after, uh, things, uh, uh become, uh, the, the days start, begin gradually becoming longer because you see, you, you need to see what, what happened here is that he was praying, right? He was fasting and praying and asking for mercy, apparently. But when he sees the days become longer, his response is, it is nature's course. It is the world's course, right? It is, it is a, a, a this is a natural cycle. So if you think about it, he, he, he actually does not see his prayers as being answered. Right, what, what's happening now is happening despite his prayers, not because of us, not as a response to his prayers. Okay, so what is he actually celebrating here? But you could say he's celebrating uh, what he discovered about nature. It's a beautiful cycle. He's celebrating because he's relieved that, that everything is going to be okay. So this I still can understand, except I'm trying to understand what, what happened the next year. Okay, that's that's a little bit harder to understand because the next year he celebrates both periods. So he begins by first of all, the fact that he celebrates, he re-celebrates, okay, the days that he celebrated the previous year, that's understandable. But why is he celebrating the days that he fasted on? Okay, that's 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 a little bit strange. You know, when when a person is 
is uh, uh, saved from danger. For example, if he recovers from a ser serious illness, right? So typically he would celebrate in the years to come on the day when he is uh, declared healthy, right? But he would not celebrate the day when he received the, the bad news about his illness, right? I don't know anyone who received uh, news from the doctor telling him that he has cancer or any other disease. And then later on, when he recovered, celebrates that same day, the date when he received the bad news from the doctor. You usually celebrate the days when you receive the good news that your, uh, uh, your blood tests are okay and, and you're going to be okay, right? So why is he celebrating the first, uh, the, the, the first eight days? Okay, that's, that's one question. Um, we'll think about that a little bit later. I want to also point to the fact that uh, when Chazal choose to attribute to Adam the insight uh, of the cycle of the world, okay, this is not a trivial thing because uh, understanding nature as a system that conducts itself in accordance with a fixed cycle rather than by divine intervention was not very common in ancient times. I mean, maybe some philosophers, some Greek philosophers thought that. But the common view was that the forces of nature uh, are performing the wishes of God, or if you were, uh, uh, if you believed in, in gods, pagan uh, gods, okay? And, and in order to be protected from the forces of nature, what people had to do was to keep their covenant with God, if you, if you were Jewish, or uh, if you were pagan, to appease the gods through either prayer or sacrifices, right? That's what people did. Um, and to say, again, at that time, at in, in ancient times, to say um, there is a natural scientific cycle that the world works by, okay? That the days become shorter and then they become longer again. That's an insight that that's... Uh, 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 most people didn't think like that, okay? So, so understanding that, uh, uh, if we think of, of, of uh, I, I see there's a, there's a question here. So uh, yes, Yael, please. Thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt you mid-sentence. No, That's okay, sure. Um, I'm just wondering about the possibility of our translation of that phrase the minhag shel olam hu. Mm -hmm. I, I think we might consider that as um, olam hu meaning God. So mm. this is the behavior of God. So I, I don't think that we necessarily have to attribute this to teva or nature but rather that, oh, God is responding to my prayers and my fasts. Um, well, I, I tried looking at that phrase, minagoshel olam, okay? I looked it up in different places and different appearances of it in the Talmud. And usually, I mean, the phrase is minagoshel olam, okay? The who refers to what's happening now. Okay, and minagoshel olam is a is is a term, is a phrase, and it 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 does relate to nature. Okay, it it, it relates to the natural uh, cycle or natural process of things. So uh, across the board, if you look in in the Talmud or in rabbinic sources, uh, there uh, minagoshel olam does uh, does not refer to God. It refers to to uh, natural uh, processes or to uh, uh, different uh, uh, phenomena that in in the world. Okay, that's usually what 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 it means. So, um, so that's why I I think that that he his insight is that what's happening now is not a response to his prayers. Okay, it's happening despite his prayers. It's ha and it's basically happening. Uh, it would happen even if he he had not prayed. Okay, it's happening with him or without him. And and that's that's not an easy thing to 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 accept or to understand in those times, okay. But but I think that's 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 what he that I, I think that's what he was uh, understanding here. Now, um, when when um, when you when you understand that, I think if you if we look again at the story, 
I think that what we're seeing here is that uh, uh, I, I think the answer to this and the answer to the first question I asked, why is he celebrating the first days? I think it's actually the same answer. I think that what, what Adam is going through here is a process of maturation. And the maturation, during this process of maturation, he actually develops a new concept uh, relating to prayer, how he understands prayer. In the beginning, he understands prayer as a means to receive something from God, okay? He prays because he's in trouble. He feels that he's, he's very anxious. And he prays in order for God to have mercy on him and to, to actually uh, help him out, okay, or forgive him and, and not, not uh, so that he shouldn't die. Um, and and that, that, that's, I think, the way that he uh, uh, grasps uh, prayer in the beginning. I think that later on he understands something new about prayer, he actually, or, or about the worship of God. I think what he understands is when he sees that the world is has this natural cycle okay this is of course Chazal thinking the rabbis thinking uh they're telling the story about adam will soon relate to the reason why they tell them about uh, tell it about adam but i i think that they, they're they're creating the story here there's not a, a historical right uh, uh um story actually saying what adam or Rishon, we don't see this in the torah anywhere and we don't really know what what he did, but uh, I think the Chazal are, are creating the story about him in order to create a message, and to, to convey a message. And I think that their message is that Adam uh, uh, sees this natural cycle, and then understands something about the world. He understands that that things that are um, taking place in the world are taking place. He, he's not the center of the world. It's not all about him. Things are taking place in the world, or the and nature works, uh, uh, and not not and, th and this is this is very different from what most people understood at that time. Okay, well, and pagan culture, and, and like I said before, understood the world. And the, a, everything in nature is the will of God, which who who wants something to happen at this very minute, and it's usually a response to whether people. Uh, appeased the gods or did not appease them? Did, did they bring the sacrifices or not? Okay, sometimes uh, they needed flattery to the gods in order to be saved from the powers of nature. But but what what uh, Chazal are putting into Adam's uh, character here into his mind is that he understands that that worshiping worshiping God is not just a means to to receive protection from nature. And nature is something that uh, works naturally, as we know it is today. So in, in that case, what, what is the, uh, uh, the goal of prayer? What, what does prayer do? Or what does the worship of God do? What I think that the insight that he has here is that prayer is a means of communication. And prayer is about the discussion or the, the encounter with God, not about what I receive from God. It's not a give and take thing. It's not something that it's just meant to 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 for for God to give me something. Okay, that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, of course, it's it also is a part of prayer. But the main thing that prayer prayer is about, or or uh, avodat Hashem, worship of God, is about, is about communication with God. It's having a relationship with God, and and I think that that's what what Adam understands, and I think. Once he understands that, he understands that whatever happens to him, whether the good or the bad, whether it's the uh, uh, um, the time when he was uh, uh, in, in, uh, experiencing anxiety or the times that he was happy or that he felt safe, these are all part of that same relationship. And the main thing that he's looking for in prayer is to communicate this to have a communication with God, to have a relationship with God, and to, and to, to speak to him about this. And, and so, so whether the prayers affect what's happening in reality or not, that's not the main point. The main point is actually to, to communicate with God. And that's why, on one hand, he says, Min he, he understands that there's a natural cycle in the world. 
but he also understands that what expected what's expected of him is a uh, religious response to things, okay, which is, again, not about changing reality or influencing reality. It's about the communication itself, okay? So when he's celebrating in future years, when he's celebrating both the eight days when he was fasting and the eight days when he was celebrating, okay? He has he he is actually saying, okay, a celebration is making that um uh you want to mute everybody for a second and then I'll unmute myself again. Okay. Um okay. Uh so when when he's uh uh when, when he's celebrating a celebration like this, creating a, a Yom Tov, creating a, a Chag, is a religious response. It's a religious action. It's, a, it's part of my relationship with God. And that relationship is not dependent on, on, on the course of my life, whether good things happen or bad things happen. It's all part of that relationship. Okay, so that's that's I think what what man understands here, what what Adam understands here in this story. Now I want to take a look a little bit beyond the uh, boundaries of the story itself. Okay, to let, look at the wider context of the story. Um, so uh, this is the second source. If we continue so in the sugya, there could you just explain why you are tr attributing the ideas of Rav Hanan Bar Rava to Adam Harishon. I mean, surely this is a Babylonian thinking, not Adam Harishon. No, I did. That, I, I, that's exactly what I said. I said that that the rabbis here are using Adam Harishon as a character in the story. Okay, but but it's actually the, the rabbinic views that they're conveying here. They're actually telling us their view of the world and their religious view. Now, why why did they tell the story about Adam Arishon? I think that that the reason is that uh, uh, when you choose Adam Arishon as the main character of your story, you're actually saying something about uh, uh, something universal about about all mankind. Okay, you're trying to say something that well, you know the the, the feeling that people feel when winter is advancing is common to all mankind. And again, today it's a little bit of uh, uh, right blues that we feel. But in the ancient world, before the discovery of science, before the modern world, um, when winter came, people felt real anxiety because they weren't sure that that they would be able to make it through this winter um, without the sources of heat from the sun and without the with the, uh, with less light. Okay, people are really anxious. People really uh, experience winter as as a as, as a as a difficult, threatening thing, and uh, this is universal. Okay, this is this this is common to all mankind. So I think the religious response that they're talking about here is also something that they see as as possibly being common to all mankind. Okay, that's why I think they choose the the character of Adam here for for the story. Um, now, if we proceed a few more lines into the sugya, we'll find a similar, another story, which is similar to the first one. Um, I'll read it from the English. Our sages taught on the day that Adam was created, when the sun set upon him, he said, woe is me, perhaps it is because I sinned that the world is becoming dark around me and returning to chaos and void. And this is the death that is imposed upon me by heaven. He sat weeping all night with Hava crying opposite him. When dawn arrived, he said, this is the way of the world. Okay, He arose and sacrificed a bull whose horns preceded its hoofs. And in keeping with the verse, and this is a verse from Tehillim, and it shall please the Lord better than a bull that has horns and hoofs. Okay, uh, uh, in, in the verse there in Tehillim, Okay, the, this is a description of this bull, and the, the horns are mentioned before the hoof. So the medrash here is saying the midrash is actually saying it, it's 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 uh, um, reading this as relating to a bull in wh who was born with first 
the the horns came and then the hoofs. So we'll we'll see in a minute which 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 bull this is referring to. Now um, you see the similarity between the two stories, okay? Except this is not talking about the winter. This is talking about the first time that Adam experienced uh, the night coming, right? When the sun set for the first time, and again he's experiencing anxiety because uh, the darkness. Is, is very frightening for him. He doesn't know that night will pass and daytime will come again, okay? So he's, again, responding to this in a, in a very anxious way. And except it's a little bit, the response is a little bit different here, right? He, uh, uh, you can notice he sat weeping. It also describes Chava crying opposite him, okay? And then when Don arrived, he says, okay, this is the way of the world. I understand this. And he brings a sacrifice. Okay, so so um, there's some things that are similar and some things that are that are different here. And again, uh, I'm talking about the ancient world in which nighttime was a time of fear. Okay, we know that that Chazal also uh, uh, some of the prayers that we daven at night are uh, uh, instated because of this fear. Right, we say Hashkiveinu. Right during the nighttime, we say Kriyat Shema Lamita with all kinds of psukim that that are uh, uh, talking about protection uh, uh, because because people were very fearful of of uh, of night. Now uh, and Adam Rishon especially because he doesn't even know that the night will have an end. Now he, he uh, 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 in the end he again responds with a religious response, bringing a sacrifice is a religious response. But again, it's not a response. Uh, uh, he's not bringing the sacrifice because his prayers were answered. In fact, it doesn't even say here that he was praying. He brings it as, again, as creating a type of relationship, but a more mature relationship with God, okay? Understanding that day and night, the cycle is the way of the world. It's min ha'goshel olam, and he doesn't need to pray in order to be protected from these natural forces. He, what, he, what he needs is to uh, uh, um, bring his feelings and his emotions and to express them in a religious way and uh, communicating with God, okay? The uh, sacrifice in this case, the korban, is, is a type of, of communication with God. Now, um, let's talk about this bull for a minute. Um, what does it mean that the bull's horns came first before its hoofs? Uh, it's... Uh, uh, apparently relating to the first bull that was created, okay, and and um, as opposed to a a, a, a calf, a, a, a little like a small bull which is born, okay. This uh, the midrash in different places says that the first bull that was created, right, right, was created from the ground, came out of the ground with its head coming out first. So first, it it's it's uh, uh, horns come out and then. And, and then the hoofs, okay? And this is, so this is relating to a specific bull, the first bull that, that was actually created. Why, why would the story uh, mention this? So um, there's an article uh, written by a, a researcher called Ishai Kiel a few years ago, who says that uh, this is the Bavli, this is the Babylonian Talmud. And he compares this to uh, what we find in, the culture that the Babylonian Amoraim were facing, okay, in there around them, the the Gentile culture, which was the the uh, the Persian religion, uh, the, the Zoroastrianism, okay, which was a little bit different from, or very different actually, from from the Roman culture which the Amoraim in Eretz Israel were were encountering, okay, and in uh, uh, he found in these Persian sources. That they were that that uh, uh, they had this mythology, and one of the things that they found that he found in those stories in their this uh, ancient Persian mythology was the mentioning of such a, a bull. Uh, uh, and later on, it says that that bull actually didn't have horns; he had one horn, so he was like a unicorn. Okay, he had one, uh, only a single horn, and and in in the Persian mythology, they have stories about this again, the bull with a single horn or a unicorn like this, which, which is uh, um, actually part of a, a battle 
um, between different forces. Okay, and again, this is like a, 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 this is a, a pagan way of seeing things as the forces of nature um, actually being attributed to different gods fighting between them. Okay, or, or uh, 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 when they have a conflict between them, and each god represents a different force in nature. So that that so so this this bull was part of those those uh, 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 stories about the uh, ancient gods uh, um, fighting between them, and that was what was uh, influencing the different times in nature, uh, darkness and light. Okay, and without going into this in too much detail, because we don't have a, a lot of time, um, I, I, I just want to say that I, I, he already says in this article, and I, I think he's correct, that what the Sugya is doing here, okay, like it does in many places, is actually uh, um, referring to those mythologies, because that's what people were encountering around them in Gentile culture, but it's creating an alternative, right? And in this in this alternative, this bull with a single uh, horn is not a god or is not re representing one of the forces. It's just a sacrifice that that Adam is bringing to the one god. There's only one god. He controls all of nature and everything in nature, good or bad, uh, darkness and light, it all comes from him. So the, in, instead of being a force it, with, with with its own power, this bull is is actually a sacrifice that that man brings to God and in, in an understanding that there's only one God and God controls everything. Now, uh, if we look at this uh, uh, in a wider view, so we see these these two stories. Okay, the first story, which is relating to uh, uh, um, pagan holidays in the Roman culture, and the second story, which is also relating to the Persian culture, and we see, I think, I think uh, uh, the picture that we get here is a complex picture, because on one hand, it is creating an alternative, right? It is saying what is incorrect about the, uh, the, the pagan way of understanding things, and saying we believe in one God, and everything comes from him, everything is, is attributed to him. On the other hand, what uh, if we if if we think about it, um, I think the story is also looking at these pagan holidays or or pagan uh, traditions, and is saying um, they are they, they are wrong, but they have a kernel of truth in them. Okay, let's look again. Let's go back to the first story and 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 say that that again the the, the pagans have these holidays around the winter solstice and these 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 holidays are are false they're wrong but but there is a kernel of truth there because it's saying that originally these holidays were created by adam as part of his relationship with with the one god only later on they became corrupted and and became the pagan holidays that that the mishnah is mentioning but it, so Again, this is a complex message because it's saying, on one hand, it's saying the way that they celebrate it is wrong or corrupt. On the, on the other hand, it's saying that 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 they do have uh, uh, um, an origin which is actually uh, originating from from something true. Now, I want to look at this message in the wider context of 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 the uh, Talmud here and in order to do that I'm going to look at the Mishnah for a reg for uh, okay let's take a look at the we'll go to the end of the source sheet here and and see uh source number five we find the Mishnah the halachic um ha halachic reference to these uh holidays these pagan festivals and it says on the three, this is this is the first Mishnah in Masechet Avodah It says on the three days preceding the festivities of idolaters, it is forbidden to transact business with them, to lend articles to them, or borrow anything from them, to advance or receive any money from them, to repay a debt or receive repayment from them. Which actually means, in simpler words, okay, you don't have anything to do with these idolaters. Um, around surrounding their their uh, pagan holidays 
Okay, you don't you have any business with them in order to be. At, what? Why is the Mishnah saying this? Because it wants Jews to keep a distance from these holidays. It doesn't want them involved in any way in these in these holidays. Okay, so 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 even not only the holiday, the day itself, the date, but even three days beforehand, and in the Gemara it also says three days afterwards. Um, you have nothing to do with these people, okay, when they're celebrating these, these, these pagan holidays. That's the halacha here, okay? And this is referring to those same holidays which appear in the, in the first story. So, that's, so, so I think when we look at the, the complete picture here, so what we're actually seeing here is, um, I, I think we're seeing that, that, that this is like going in, in two different directions. The halacha on one hand is creating a boundary between the, a, a very solid boundary between Jews and these pagan holidays, okay? But once that's said, okay, and, that, and, and, and once these boundaries are created and once halacha makes sure that people, that Jewish people keep their distance from those holidays, um, what, what, uh, uh, th then we come to the Agadah. And the Agadah is, is, is uh, adding uh, a little bit of a different approach. Is saying, since we feel safe because of these boundaries, we can also look at these pagan holidays in a more complex way. We can also view them and see that on one hand, they're mistaken in the way that they celebrate them. Of course, they're celebrating them as part of worshiping these idols or these uh, uh, gods, and that's incorrect. But there's also a positive kernel there. Okay, there's also something that we all have in common and, 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 and all of humanity has in common. This, uh, the, the understanding that when winter comes or when nighttime comes, it's something that makes people anxious and that people need to uh, respond to it in a, a certain religious response, okay? That's, that's something that's common, okay? That's not a boundary. That's something that's actually saying, okay, there's, there's something here that, that we all have in common. So it's very interesting here, the dynamic between the halakha on one hand, which is, is, is separating us from, from the, uh, uh, and telling us to have nothing to do with these holidays. And then I think on that basis, the Agadah can actually uh, uh, allow for a more nuanced view of, of, of these uh, holidays. And now we come to uh, uh, our uh, context here, of Hanukkah. If you, of course, I'm sure you noticed that when it mentions a holiday that uh, lasts for eight days, so that reminds us of Hanukkah, okay? Uh, Eight-day holiday in this season of the year, right? This is exactly the season. And, and the themes of that holiday are light and darkness, okay? So the story doesn't mention Hanukkah uh, explicitly, but I think implicitly it is hinting to uh, Hanukkah, right? And and what is that? Again, I think it's it's conveying this more complex message. It's saying um, this is something common to all human culture to celebrate a holiday or to respond with a religious response during these days. Okay, and we have Hanukkah, and other cultures have their own holidays. And and again, we have this uh, um, uh, uh, multiple. Uh, uh, multiply nuanced view, okay, saying that uh, on one hand, we need to be distanced from, from those days and from the different ways that other nations uh, celebrate these times. And on the other hand, it's also saying, wait, but there's also something in common, okay? It's not that's just chance that, that uh, everybody's celebrating holidays of light uh, at this time, or festivals of light, okay? So th this is the, I think what we see here is the way that Chazal use the uh, um, different uh, dynamics between Halakha and Agada, how you use, uh, how you put them together, and you have them as, as instruments that that can, can uh, each one has a different role, and together they can create a, 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 a more uh, a, a complex message. Um, I just for uh, want to uh, do one more last things before I take a look at the chat, and I hope to answer at least some of the questions there. Although may, I may not have time to answer all of them, um, this story 
which we saw in the Gemara, has an earlier source, an earlier version in uh, um, uh, sources that are for, created in Eretz Israel. Okay, the Gemara was uh, the Bavli created in Babylonia. And here, the, the earlier version of, of this story if in Bereshit Rabbah and in Yerushalmi. Okay, now we're not, we don't have enough time to really go through them, but I'm just going to uh, um, take a look at the second story here in the Yerushalmi, okay, and uh, just to, to, to give a little taste of it. So it says here like this, Rav said, Adam instated the festival of Kalendis. Again, Kalends or Kalendis, that's the uh, uh, second pagan holiday, which comes after the winter solstice. When he saw that the nights were getting longer, he said, woe is me, perhaps the one of whom it had said, he shall strike you at your head. Okay, who is Shufcharosh? That's the Nachash, the, the serpent from Ganeiden, will come to bite me. Okay, he's feeling anxious again, and he's thinking maybe this is something that has to do with my sin from Ganeiden, and maybe it has to do with the Nachash, with the serpent uh, uh, coming to punish me or coming to bite me. Uh, uh, maybe taking advantage of the darkness and 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 sneaking uh, uh, up on me and 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 to bite me, okay. Uh, uh, and he he uh, he quotes a verse from Tehillim: "Surely darkness shall bruise or envelop me," which in the Hebrew is "achoshech uh, yeshufeni." Uh, okay, I use the same word yeshufeni about choshech about darkness as the word in Bereshit about the Nachash, about the, the snake, okay, so he, he feels that, that uh, uh, now that's not the simple reading of that verse in Tehillim, but this is a Midrashic reading of it. Again, seeing the darkness is maybe biting him like, like the snake. When he saw the days getting longer, he said, Kalendis, okay, that's what the Midrash says. He said the word Kalendis, and then it says Kalon Dio, now there's a big uh, uh, debate about what that's exact, what exactly that means. Ex the expression is not exactly clear whether it's Greek or Latin or a mixture of them, but uh, some suggestions are that it's actually referring to the term saying kalon dm, which is a mixture of Greek and Latin, actually saying uh, something like it's a it's a nice day, right? Because daytime arrived and he's he's feeling relieved that the, that the night is over. And and he's just uh, uh, announcing, okay, or, or, or saying saying something about, wow, it's great that it's that it's daytime and light, okay. So I won't go into this uh, 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 anymore because again, we don't have a lot of time. But I just want to point out the difference between this version and the version in the Bavli. What we see here, first of all, it's referring to the uh, to his sin in Ganeden, okay, which the Bavli doesn't bring uh, uh, the whole business of the of the serpent because. The Bavli doesn't need that in its uh, theme, in its story there. But I think the most more important point here is that that we find here uh, um, that when when he's anxious, okay, so he's afraid this has to do with the sin, but he doesn't fast and he doesn't pray. And also after he he recovers, right, when he says, saw, saw that the, uh, uh, the days are becoming longer, so he says this expression saying, wow, it's a great thing that light came back, but he's not actually, he's not sacrificing anything. He's not praying. Okay. It, it doesn't, it lacks this religious response. And going back to the story in the Bavli, I, I think that that the, the Gemara and the Bavli took that original uh, uh, kernel of story, right? The literary kernel uh, from the original story here in the Yerushalmi but it, 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 I think it, it reworked it in a way to, to convey a different message. Okay, it, 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 it didn't need the whole business of the snake because that was that's the, the main point here. And I think what it's adding here to the story in the Yerushalmi is Adam's religious response, uh, his fast, his prayer, and and the the the, the holiday which he creates afterwards. Is, again, like I said before, so I think the main point of the story here is his relationship with God, his communication with him, the, 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 his, his means of communication, which is through prayer and through creating a, a religious holiday. And I think that that's the emphasis here in the story in the Bavli, 
And again, it's like a process of maturation, right? It's like a, when, it, when, a, when a child, when a baby is born, so he, he only, what he wants from his parents is only, his whole re relationship with his parents is what he can receive, right? What he can get. He, can, he needs milk, he needs food, and these other things. But as he matures, he realizes, a person realizes that your relationship, one's relationship with one's parents is not just about getting your needs from them, it's about having a relationship, right? The relationship itself is a thing in itself. So, so I think it's the same process which uh, man in this in this uh, uh, story here is going through, and that's I think what I, I think that that's what the rabbis wanted to say to us. They, want, they wanted to say um, that uh, Hanukkah and our prayers and her, her relationship with God is the 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 higher part of it. Uh, is about um, uh, uh, conversing with him, having a conversation, uh, communicating with him, and 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 uh, as opposed to the pagan world, it's not just trying for him to protect us from the forces of nature. Uh, okay, let's look at the chat. We have a few minutes left, so um, I'll take a look at. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here, so I. I so I won't have time to relate to all of it, so I apologize. Um, uh, okay, so, so we talked about Saturnalia. Um, okay, so farmers and hunters were very aware of cycles, and uh, uh, I agree with that. I'm, I'm relating to, to this question about, but, but, but again, uh, in, in the ancient world, and especially in the pagan world, even though they were aware of cycles, the way that they that re they related to cycles in nature were as the will of the gods. They, they didn't think or they, they couldn't think of nature as, as just uh, uh, laws of physics or whatever, uh, 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 um, just... Uh, um, uh, just happening as a natural cycle like that without the intervention of, of of gods. Okay, even though they were aware of these cycles, but they again they saw them as a direct intervention of, of the gods, and that's why they thought that that what they need is to appease those gods. Um, okay, high holidays and Sukkot. We pray for forgiveness of our sins, and then. We celebrate a Sukkot. Okay, that's also thank you. That's also an interesting remark here. That 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 uh, um, again it begins with a fast and with with praying and 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 then then a celebration. Um, now, uh, okay, so celebration of January first as as a new year. Uh, the Romans celebrated that originally. That was the that that was the the festival of, that they call here. Calendis, okay, or calends, which we is, is uh, uh, reminds us of the world of the word calendar, okay, and it was January first, uh, so that came before the Christians, the Romans, the Julian calendar uh, of Julius Caesar already had that as, uh, uh, and and in, and uh, um, there's a big debate in 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 uh, scholarship if the, the Christians later created Christ, uh, Christmas. On December twenty first, twenty fifth, because of uh, 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 it, so it wasn't necessarily historically the actually the actual date of the birth of Jesus, but but something that they tried to connect to uh, uh, again this this Roman uh, uh, pagan holiday of of the victory of the sun. Uh, don't don't forget that the Romans uh, um, accepted Christianity in the fourth century and tried to, to uh, uh, the Roman church tried to, to uh, actually shape Christianity in a way that was similar to what people in the Roman world were used to before in order for it to be easier for people to accept it. Um, okay, chaos from darkness to light in God's laws of nature and Bereshit to the light from man as perceived by Chazal. Franco at prayer complimenting Sukkot. Okay, I agree. Uh, um, and um, OK. 
Okay. Um, okay, Satar, again, Satar, uh, uh, there's a question here about Satar and, and the word Satar Nura. The, the word Satar usually spelled with a taf. Samach taf resh in Aramaic is, is to, uh, uh, when, we, when we say that about, uh, 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 is usually to, to destroy something. Okay, satar is to like to 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 restore, uh, like a building is to destroy the building. Stira, okay, so, yes, it's like stira, yeah. Binyan vestira. Okay, stira is the opposite of binyan. Yeah. So satar nura would be to destroy the light, okay, or the fire. Uh, uh, um, uh, let me take it. Okay, uh, uh, Okay, the word star, I think, is a different word that is not necessarily uh, connected here. And um, okay, uh, okay, uh, uh, there were, there's a reference here to the horn of the bull. Uh, uh, maybe also that, yeah, the Greeks. Made, there's a there's a midrash about that. The Greeks made the Jews ride on the horn of the bull, so may, maybe it has to do with that as well. I agree. And uh, um, again, so the, the 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 rabbis. I'm I'm referring to this whole uh, uh, comment here about Christianity. The rabbis. Uh, uh, well, Hanukkah again wasn't created as a response to Christmas because it came. <laughs> A long, long time before, <laughs> before Christmas was, uh, was created. Okay, so so no, uh, no, no. That's not what I said. I said that it was a response to the pagan holiday. The this was right. predated Christmas. So I said that 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 Hanukkah was created as a response to a pagan holiday, not to Christmas. And in the same way that the Catholic Church tried to turn pagan holidays into Christian festivals as far as i'm concerned the rabbis saw that this was the time of the year when the saturnalia and calendula and whatever it is were were mm -hmm. celebrated and it would be great because why did they pick this time of the year we all know that hanukkah habayat happened on sukkis why did they pick this time to make hanukkah so it makes a lot of sense that they pick this time to, to as a response to the assimilation and the attraction to pagan holidays I, I agree. First of all, I agree. That's definitely possible. Um, I, I would say that maybe uh, I'll, I'll add uh, uh, that 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 they that they actually uh, understood that there is religious significance to this time, and they're saying, "Okay, let's give our, our ter alternative Jewish religious response to these times in 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 the form of a of a Jewish holiday." And and it went together with with uh, uh, the historical uh, uh, um, events of of uh, Hanukkah, the Maccabees, and, and 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 everything. So so they put, put it all together, and and that's why the theme of light is, in Hanukkah is so central. So so uh, um, yeah. Uh, so thank you for that. And uh, okay. So we, uh, uh, so I want to thank all of you uh, for being with me here today, and uh, wish wish us all a happy Hanukkah continuation of a, of a happy Hanukkah Hanukkah Sameach, and and uh, uh, um, I hope uh, uh, we all have a chance maybe to meet sometime, not only on Zoom. So uh, goodbye and thank you. Rabbi. everybody. Thank you Excellent. very much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting. Tadarabha. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Anukasameh. Anukasameh.